confession of faith, Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the loving, living God. Let's all greet one another. Let's become a spiritual person. Seems like a simple greeting, but it's a very important greeting. We must become spiritual people. What does it mean to be a spiritual person? Everything you see, hear, and feel, you must interpret it in a spiritual way. But 99% of people, they interpret it with their emotions. You should become spiritual people so that God will help you realize. What's the title today? It is Grace to Realize. It is the greatest grace. It should actually be longer. It should be, it is the greatest grace to realize. This week, the 27th, 2024 World Missions Convention will be held under the theme, The Watchman with the Partisan. So we have many missionaries present here today. It will be a time for commissioned and joint missionaries worldwide to gather and gain new strength to evangelize the 237 nations and 5,000 people groups within the same stream of the word. Because missions fields can be very difficult and they can be very lonely in the missions field because they really have to give their everything, their physical and their spiritual things, they need to devote everything. And so through the missions convention, For our missions convention, we are really the only denomination that has such a large convention every single year where we invite all missionaries from across the world. And it's really a time where we emphasize missionaries gaining new strength. And we also hear what kind of spiritual activities the missionaries are doing in their fields. And the missionaries that are really doing their ministry properly They go to all the different departments at our church and they see what kind of ministry is being done and they take all the necessary uh, information because they really want to raise up the Yewon church within their missions field. Whereas many people, some people just let it pass by because they don't have a field. So really pray that it is a time where the missionaries can receive strength. And then next Lord's Day, the second service will be held as a United Missions Festival. And I will be giving a sermon in the third service. And then at 2.30 p.m., the Yewon Missions Convention will be held under the theme, Enlarge the Tent of 237 Missions. The Missions Expo will also proceed on the same day. And simply put, it will be a time for all missionaries and all Yewon believers to become completely oneness with missions. And through this time, I hope that the missionaries can really receive strength and find a newfound vision as they go back to their missions fields. And I hope you can help out with that. And missions is actually not only the reason for the existence of our Yewon Church, but it's an eternal mission that we as children of God must hold on to throughout our lives. It's not something that we have a choice to do. So we must go to the ends of the earth. It is the 237 nations, the 5,000 people groups. And we must align the direction of our life with that so that we can really live a joyful life and experience the fulfillment of God's word. That is the direction. So the will and direction of God is pointed towards evangelism and missions as well. And so the time schedule of our history points towards the Lord's second coming. And we follow according to the time schedule of Jesus. And so there's a start and there's an end, and that end will be the Lord's second coming. And no one knows the exact time schedule of that second coming. Only the God, only God knows. However, Jesus gave us a hint about when that last second coming will be. It is in Matthew chapter 24, verse 14. 
and this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. It needs to be proclaimed to all nations. And I have a question about this, and I felt it even more when I went to Pakistan recently. The end of the world, it's the Muslims, because it's really impossible to give the gospel to Muslims. 80% of Muslims, or maybe even more, they have never heard of the gospel before. Because evangelists cannot go there, they cannot raise churches there, and it's not broadcasted in any way. And so they all have to go to hell without receiving salvation because they never even had a chance to hear of this gospel. So how can we deliver the gospel to this Muslim field? It really feels like the end of the world. However, Jesus is saying, even to those Muslim nations, we must proclaim the gospel in order for the end to come. And this is a clear reason why we must take on the challenge of missions to evangelize the two through seven nations and 5,000 people groups. So may all members of Year One Church be 24 hours with missions. It doesn't matter if you don't even know what missions is, because I didn't know what missions was when I established the church. God told me to begin this church for missions, but I didn't even know what it was. And I said, you told me to do missions, but I don't know what that is. Well, how do I do this? But within prayer, God made me realize. And I looked it up. How do I do missions? However, I realized that around 15 minutes um, from where I was, there was a like a training center for missionaries. And it was like a very big house that was bought for around nine people and they were living together and receiving training. And that's where I met missionary Chong who was commissioned to Japan. And so we all received training together there. And that's where I met uh, Dr. Lee Taeyong as well, who was actually the translator when Billy Graham came to Korea. And so you can start today. Being involved 24 hours with a life of missions is the 237 economy. And it is the economy of light and the economy of remnants. It's all within that. And God grants the economy of missions to those with a clear reason to carry out the 237 missions. No matter how much you pray for the economy and for the abundance within your work field, God will not answer. However, if you really give the devotion for the 237 missions and God can really see your core, then God will give more than enough to you. It's the same for missionaries as well. As a missionary, if you're in the field and you always think about money, and you're always worried about money, it won't work. Your thoughts, your priorities must change first. You must really become all in to delivering this life, this salvation, whether the people that are listening take it in or not. And it's the same for pastors as well. If you're so worried about money and you can't even go into the missions field and you can't even go into the field to evangelize, that's not what God wants and that's not the God that I experienced. God gives more than enough and fills you with abundance. And that's the spiritual pride that I have. God abundantly fills me. It will be done according to your faith. And so things regarding economy and finances, those all come after God. That is the test. And many people crumble down when they face this problem. 
So I bless all members in the name of the Lord that there may be evidence of enlarging the tent of the economy of 237 missions in all work fields of our believers. In today's passage, Jesus says this to his disciples, Do you not yet understand? These words were not spoken by Jesus to the unbelievers of the world today. The disciples who had seen all the America all the amazing miracles that Jesus had performed and had heard countless times the messages of the gospel of heaven, Jesus was saying this expression to these disciples. And it's really pitiful that Jesus has to ask them, do you not yet understand? How long have you been going to church? How long have you been going to year one church? And you still do not understand. And not just in this passage, Jesus repeats the question, do you not yet understand, to the disciples several times. It's not just one time. He continuously says it because they do not realize. So looking at this from a different approach, as the title of today's sermon suggests, we see that to realize is truly God's amazing grace. This is not done by our will. And it's not about whether you're kind or not. It's about realizing. And in Deuteronomy chapter 29, verses 2 to 4, states that God must make us realize. God must be the one to make us realize. And Moses summoned all Israel and said to them, You have seen all that the Lord did before your eyes in the land of Egypt to Pharaoh and to all his servants and to all his land the great trials that your eyes saw, the signs and those great wonders. But to this day, the Lord has not given you a heart to understand or eyes to see or ears to hear. God made it so that they were unable to understand. Realizing or not realizing, it's up to God. God had done an amazing work. We can see that the Israelites were spiritually dull and did not properly understand. And furthermore, there was no work from God that enabled them to realize. The Israelites were unable to realize. And it is the same for us right now as well. Only when the Holy Spirit of the Lord enlightens us can we discover the word's true meaning. And so at church or at training, you must really pray to God. Before anything else, you must say, Father God, please let me be able to realize your word. Because just listening to it and actually realizing it and understanding it is different. Many people hear it, but they are unable to realize it. Only when God allows it can you actually realize. And because you are unable to realize or understand, you don't have change, you don't have growth, you don't have a field. Please allow the Holy Spirit to help me understand. What is especially important is our spiritual attitude. God does not discern people, but He discerns spiritual attitudes. Our spiritual attitude of wanting to understand God's Word, wanting to receive God's Word, wanting to receive God's guidance. The people who really have the spiritual heart, God will pour down His amazing grace. But to the people who have a hardened heart and negative heart, and they think, oh, let's see what the pastor will say today in the Word, that's not it. You must really have a yearning heart. You must really have a yearning heart that 
is determined to receive the grace and word that God is pouring down on you. So may all members of Yewon Church be awake 24 hours to realistically experience the power of God's word through today's passage. And receiving that power, I bless you in the name of the Lord to become absolute disciples of Christ to enlarge the four main tents. The first main point, the establishment of the word as imprint, root, and nature. Mark chapter 8 begins with the miracle of seven loaves and two fish that Jesus performed. And you might think it is a repetition of the miracle of the five loaves and two fish because it is so similar, but it is a completely different, separate miracle. So fundamentally, the miracle of five loaves and two fish was performed towards the Jews, whereas this miracle of seven loaves and two fish was performed towards the Gentiles. Jesus had visited the Gentile region of Tyre and returned to Galilee, but he was still in the region where Gentiles lived. And when news spread that Jesus was there, many Gentiles gathered, and what we would now call an evangelism conference took place for three days. The word of Jesus was so sweet and profound that the people did not even return home for three days as they were completely absorbed in his word and received grace. And so three days had passed because they were so absorbed in his word. Those who receive grace, they don't say that the sermon is long or short. They don't even realize. They just think, oh, it's the end already? I wish he'd done more. That's what's normal. If you think it's boring, if you're tired, that's really the stance of a new believer. They were so yearning of his word that three days had passed. And so after the three days, all the food that people had brought were gone. And when Jesus saw these Gentiles, he really had a heart of compassion and pity towards them. And when I went to Pakistan recently, this is what they looked like. I couldn't see that far, but I could see the people in the front who had really had a yearning heart to receive this. And I realized they really had a loving heart. And so I really think I should go more often into Pakistan and Muslim countries and really raise up a church there. And so within this crowd, some people came from close by, but some people had come from very far away. And Jesus thought that if they were to return home without eating, they would become exhausted and faint on the way. Because people need to absorb the physical food as well. For three days, they were unable to eat or sleep properly to receive his word. And so he wanted to provide physical food for their bodies as well. However, in verse 4 of the passage, the disciples expressed their unbelief despite already having experienced the miracle of five loaves and two fish. So he says, Jesus says to feed them. But the disciples expressed their unbelief to what he said. They say, how can one feed these people with bread here in this desolate place? And so it says here, how can one feed these people with bread here in this desolate place? And it truly is a dejecting expression. Mm -hmm. 
However, what is more unfortunate is that this kind of unbelief continues even after the miracle of seven loaves and two fish where 4,000 were fed, leaving seven baskets left over. It's really unfortunate that they experience these miracles where it can only be done by God. They had never heard of it or seen it before. They had experienced these answers that were unprecedented, and yet they once again fell into unbelief. In verse 14, they got on a boat to cross to the other side of the sea. And the disciples forgot to bring bread, and there was only one loaf of bread on that boat. And the bread at the time was very large, and they could even use it as a pillow, and they would continuously eat from that same large bread. And we can see that in pictures as well. However, we can see here, with only one loaf of bread on that boat, it was insufficient. And seeing the situation, Jesus gives a spiritual teaching relating to the bread. And it was to be aware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. And leaven is a yeast that makes the bread rise. And what it's trying to say here is that this leaven is actually a symbol of influence. And this leaven contains both a positive meaning and a negative meaning. And in today's passage, it is used with negative meaning. It implies the spread of negative influence. When it refers to the leaven of the Pharisees, it refers to religious formalism, like outward appearances and hypocrisy. And the leaven of Herod refers to the spiritual state of secularism that is easily swept away by the trends of this world. So it's talking about the spread of such negative influences and how it can really spread very quickly. These days, we have so many things on our phone from YouTube to all these group chats. And that's the age we're living in. It's the age where we spread things so fast. And this, in this case, it's talking about the spread of this negative influence. And Jesus is telling the disciples that they must be cautious of these things. And so he's talking about a spiritual state that is secular and following the things of the world. However, the disciples were completely unable to realize this. So Jesus is using a comparison to tell the disciples because otherwise he would be attacked again. However, the disciples are unable to realize what he's saying. So when Jesus told them to be aware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Herod, they only focused on the leaven. It's an astounding message of Jesus right now, but they don't know about that. They're focused on the leaven. The leaven, and then they think, we forgot the bread. And they are blaming one another that they forgot the bread. And they're fighting each other and blaming each other about this bread. That's what's happening right now. And Jesus expresses his saddened heart towards these disciples. Verses 17 to 18 reads, And Jesus, aware of this, said to them, Why are you discussing the fact that you have no bread? Do not yet perceive or understand. Are your hearts hardened? Having eyes do you not see, and having ears do you not hear? And do you not remember? It is really quite embarrassing. Jesus feels pity towards the hardened hearts of the disciples and their closed eyes and ears, as well as their inability to remember. He thought it was really unfortunate. How much more must he convey for them to be able to make the correct spiritual judgment? That's what he's trying to say.
Although the disciples directly witnessed the miracles that Jesus performed, they could not establish what they had seen as their imprint root and nature in their hearts and their minds. Thus, when problems came about, they were stuck in their own thoughts. They reverted to their own limitations. They are caught up in their circumstances. Despite repeatedly hearing the precious words proclaimed by Jesus, these words were not established as imprints, roots, and nature within them. So when issues and events occurred, they complained and they blamed one another and they became overwhelmed with worry and anxiety. They were exactly following the footsteps of their ancestors who spent 40 years in the wilderness after Exodus. The state of the disciples not only illustrates the tragedy of our failure to realize, but also clearly shows that changing one's old nature is not easy. Changing your nature is not easy. And I truly believe that without the work of the Holy Spirit, it's impossible. How can one change your nature without the work of the Holy Spirit? It's difficult. And changing one's nature takes time. You need a lot of time. Just because someone becomes a child of God by believing in Jesus Christ does not mean that instantly you become gospel nature. Instead, it is about discarding old habits of unbelief, worry, anxiety, concerns, complaint, and resentment through the word one by one. And that is why the restoration of worship and spiritual training is important. Those who receive training are the true disciples. Those who receive training are the true disciples of Jesus, of Ye One Church. Otherwise, you're just a believer. There is a learning theory called the principle of accumulation. And it says that after learning one thing, one should repeat it before forgetting it and then continue building upon it. So repeating what they learnt and building upon that. Only then does it become your own and allow you to grow. The same applies spiritually. Most people think you come to give worship once a week on Lord's Day and they think that that is a good walk of faith. There are many people who just come to church once a week. And we don't even have to look at those people's lives. Do you think coming to church one time will help you change your nature, will help you receive the guidance of the Holy Spirit? If that's the case, then why did God make Wednesday worship and Friday worship? It's because we lose hold of this word that we receive. We must be reminded. Two days pass and we forget. In order to continuously receive spiritual nourishment and continue to be within the stream of the word. So you come to church to receive God's word just one day on Lord's Day, and then you live the rest of the week, the six days, according to your own thoughts. You won't be receiving the guidance of the Holy Spirit. You'll be living according to your own judgment, your own thoughts, your own common sense, your own feelings. That's how you live. And that is why continuous worship and training is important. Even the disciples who initially did not realize this had accumulated three years of training with Jesus.
And that is why this became their greatest asset in their ministry after Jesus' resurrection and after Jesus ascended. According to theologians, during Jesus' public ministry, three quarters of his time was devoted to training the disciples. So he did his public ministry for three years. And in this case, it means that two years was spent on his disciples, on training his disciples. That was the time schedule. And the messages that they heard from Jesus began to flow out once the Holy Spirit came upon them. In Acts chapter 2, Peter went out and Peter's sermon began. Peter, who used to be so ignorant with the word that he had received over time, he was able to go out and really be used amazingly. And though they were physically unimpressive and often rebuked daily, these disciples ultimately transformed into the people who the world was not worthy of. They were unstoppable. I hope you also become like that, become unstoppable disciples. Year One Church is all about the community with disciples. And we really receive a lot of training. And we really go forward with a lot of training uh, with our direction. And that's why only those who are disciples are able to keep up. Really become the ones that the world is not worthy of. I bless in the name of the Lord that all believers of Yawan Church may become people of faith whom the world is not worthy of and become the main figure in establishing the firm and absolute partisan of Christ. The second main point, the spiritual training that changes perspectives. Today's text shows that there was another incident between the miracle of the feeding of the 4,000 and the event where Jesus lamented the disciples' lack of understanding. In verse 11 to 13, the Pharisees came and began to argue with him, seeking from him a sign from heaven to test him. And he sighed deeply in the spirit and said, Why does this generation seek a sign? Truly I say to you, no sign will be given to this generation. And he left them, got into the boat again, and went to the other side. So after performing the miracle of feeding the 4,000, Jesus went by boat to the region of Dalmanutha. And there the Pharisees came and attacked Jesus once again. And they questioned him and confronted him, saying, asking whether the miracles and the ministry he was doing was something that was given from heaven. And so they told him to show them a sign from heaven. The word for sign in Greek is semion, which does not merely refer to healing diseases or performing miracles of power. The Pharisees had already seen such miracles performed by Jesus. And so the sign mentioned here in the text refers to something beyond the miracles already shown. It's demanding proof that Jesus' power and authority were given by God. They were asking for a sign that would testify that Jesus was the Messiah. And looking at them, what does it say here? Jesus sighs deeply in his spirit. And this sigh is completely different from the one we saw last week when Jesus healed the sick man. It is not a sigh that sympathized with the pain of the sick, but it was a sigh of wrath towards the, the Pharisees with their hardened hearts, the Pharisees who were seized by Satan. And it was a sigh towards that age. It was a sigh towards the age without faith. No matter how many worships you listen to, how, many, how much training you receive, Jesus sighs towards those who do not change. 
Jesus says that no signs will be given to the Pharisees because they are seeking signs with the impure intention of blemishing Jesus and the crooked generation. And so to these questions of unbelief and these questions of testing Jesus, he completely got rid of them with one word. And so the commonality between the Pharisees in today's passage and an age without faith is that the hearts are hardened. This age is unable to receive grace because their hearts have hardened. They're unable to change because of that. And it carries the same meaning as the hardened heart shown by Pharaoh during Exodus. It's the same meaning. And this heart is one where everything is interpreted with a self-centeredness of Genesis chapter 3. Everything is about themselves, their pride, their benefit, their advantage. Even when they listen to the sermon, they align it with themselves. Otherwise, they don't accept that word. And it is like the path that bears no fruit, no matter how many seeds of the word are sowed. You will not have fruit. That is why spiritual training that changes perspective is important. How do you change it? Changing the perspective of self-centeredness from Genesis chapter 3 and the material-centeredness from Genesis chapter 6 and worldly success-centeredness from Genesis chapter 11 to the perspective of the three only, only Jesus Christ, only the Word of God, only the filling of the Holy Spirit. And globally renowned scientist Einstein once said, Insanity, doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. You keep doing the same thing over and over, but you always have expectations. That's what is insanity. You do the same thing and you expect change. This means it is illogical to expect different results by thinking and acting the same way. If you received the gospel, you must change. It is not information, it's transformation. You must realize when you're filled with the word, you will change. Slowly, one by one. You must boldly shift your perspective. Truly become oneness with the pulpit. Because the time schedule of God's answer is given through the pulpit. When you change your thoughts, will you experience astounding spiritual growth and will you have astounding spiritual influence? And I bless our Yemen believers in the name of the Lord to really say only Jesus Christ, only the kingdom of God, and only the filling of the Holy Spirit when you're faced with a problem. Have that spiritual perspective and with the three only, really look at your life. And so I bless you will become absolute disciples of Jesus Christ that enlarge the tent through that perspective. This is the conclusion. There is a Korean proverb that says, engrave your enemy on water, engrave the grace on the rock. And what this means is to forget what is not good for your heart. Things that do not give you grace, things that is not beneficial for you, let it flow, forget about it. However, the things that give you grace, embrace it in your heart and be thankful for those things. However, many people tend to live in opposite ways. We let the graceful things go flow by on the water and then we engrave our enemies on the rock. We engrave them in our hearts. We engrave our enemies in our hearts. Whereas we let all the grace flow by. And therefore, this results in a difficult life. 
You're holding on to this hatred. And this is the same spiritually. When you are given the grace to realize the word, do not forget that. Many people, they go to the car park after worship and they forget it in the car park. Or they go home and they have one fight with their spouse and they forget. They go to their workplace and a problem arises and they forget. It's really a state of your heart which is unable to sow fruit. Do not engrave completely useless and unworthy things on your hearts. Just let it flow by you. Otherwise, there will be no growth. May all Yewon believers live a life in which the grace of the word that God allows us to realize is in established as imprint root and nature. And thus, I believe all believers will be able to gain a new strength in any circumstances and become the footsteps of the fulfillment of the covenant that enlarges the four main tents. Let us pray. Living Father God, please let all of our believers receive the grace of realizing. Every single day, let them be able to shed their old selves and have a renewed life every single day. And let them confess that through the word they have made the new resolution and that they'll be able to really imprint root and nature of the word and let them be able to have the spiritual perspective as spiritual people. We pray all this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.